Welcome to yet another edition of Within WordPress, the podcast you want to be listening to. It's the podcast where you learn everything about all those people making up this wonderful WordPress community. With us today is all the way from Canada, is Mr. Carl Alexander. Uh, Carl, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm I'm excellent. I've been working out this uh, this afternoon, and that always uh, sort of invigorates me a little bit. So um, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, as you got you got some Atlas balls lifted. Uh, no, this is just uh, normal uh, gym stuff. Uh, no, okay. we, don't, we don't we don't we don't always go fancy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm afternoon too. Like, so I know the importance. Yeah. I wish I was a morning person and I could actually like go in the morning, but I go uh, afternoon. I I feel you on that one. Um, I can be a morning person, but I'm typically not. So, um, I ask this all of my uh, my guests, but um, um, where uh, and what is the thing that connects you to uh, to WordPress? Where can people know you from? So, how about you uh, you tell a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah. So, I got into WordPress in two thousand eight. Uh, I was like, I, okay. I basically, um, got hired at this, at this agency and they were like, I was their, their first WordPress developer. And, uh, I started their WordPress PHP team, uh, basically. And then, um, that summer i found out there was like a work camp in Montreal. So I was like, oh, like, yeah. let me go to that. And, uh. It was like one of the OGs, like Montreal was one of the older work camps um, yep. and uh, Matt used to come. So Matt was there that year um, and I just liked the feel a lot. And I, I started doing meetups and then the second year I started volunteering and I, then I started organizing events and I'm for 10 years until COVID, I was a work camp organizer in Montreal and event organizer. And then I started speaking. So I spoke at the original, uh, WordCamp US. So, um, that's and, the one in Philadelphia, uh, right? The first, yeah, one. that was the one in Philadelphia. So now I'm at, actually at two out of three OG, uh, regional, like weird or, uh, OG or big work camps that I've spoken to. Uh, I spoke yeah. at WordCamp Asia this year. That was the well, first WordCamp Asia. And I spoke at the first WordCamp US as well. So. Now I have uh, to, I have to nail the, the WordCamp Latin America. Like I have to get, I have to get into the, the first WordCamp Latin America. Yeah. You need, you need to yeah. fact WordCamp Europe is, uh, is unfortunately no longer an option for you. To yeah, first. no, it's gone. It's gone. I wasn't even traveling by then, uh, when WordCamp Europe was happening, but yeah, so I've been involved in WordPress for a long time. Um, organizing events and speaking. I was, oh, you can find me actually, I didn't even plug my site yet, but I'm at carlalexander.ca. Um, I'm also known for like writing about really advanced work programming topics or just topics around WordPress. Um, I wrote a book called object oriented programming for WordPress. I think, uh, that teaches you object oriented programming, uh, using actually it's, I think it's using WordPress. I'm really bad at shilling my old stuff, but, um, but it's, it's been, it's been a good book. Like it's sold. I've made, I've made like $30,000. Uh, with it so it's like it's pretty oh, good that's so pretty good yeah it's pretty good um for a niche book about object oriented programming so yeah. it's pretty good so i've been involved at teaching a lot of um in wordpress for a while and organizing events and mm -hmm. now i'm working on uh emir which is basically serverless wordpress which is what i talked yeah. about at wordcamp asia serverless wordpress or emir specifically Serverless WordPress that I talked about, um, specifically, I, I mean, at the end I felt bad because I, I joked about it on Twitter because I was like, you're, I hate doing a talk and you're the only thing you can like talk about. Like when you're at the end of the talk, when you're like, what tools can you use to like, uh, well, to do I, this? And then you're like literally the only tool that exists for that. Um, but the talk itself was about serverless uh wordpress itself like why how does it work um mm -hmm. why you would want to use it what is it good for um and uh why i think it's important um but 
it, I honestly, it was, it was super well received. Like I've, I've used to give five to six talks a year. Um, and I mm -hmm. think that's the most successful one I've given. Like I just got a lot of oh, yeah. inbound, right. uh, inquiries and, and things after, um, I wish it was on wordpress.tv. I don't know what's taking so long cause, uh, but it's not on wordpress.tv yet. So, I, but I I'm believe hoping you'll do that. Yeah, I believe yeah. the team quite has a has quite a big of a of a queue to process through. But uh, no, but that's exciting. Yeah. Um, have, doing a talk and then getting a lot of feedback afterwards is one of the most rewarding things I think personally. Um, yeah, I just didn't expect a lot of interest to be fair, and then a lot. Of, so I, I'm going to dive in a bit, but one of the problems that WordPress has is scaling as I think you're, uh, you've, you're a bit aware of that, uh, problem yep. yourself. Um, and scaling WordPress is a challenge and it wasn't really designed for that. Maybe, maybe and it's nice to, uh, to interject a little here. Um, yeah. scaling, I know what it means for me. You know what it means okay. for you, but yeah. for those listening who are not fully aware of what is scaling and when are, when is the threshold of now we're scaling? Oh, um, sure. I thought you were going to explain it. Um, no, no. okay. So scaling here, here, what we here. mean is, um, how to deal with, so you can have sites where your traffic is somewhat constant. Um, mm -hmm. and like the classic example is like, if you get like Reddit or something like that, then like your traffic like spikes and then your site goes down. If you don't have like something like Cloudflare yep. in front of it or or um, some other CDN solution. And a lot of the hosting companies are now very, very well suited to, to handle this kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. But there's a different type of scaling, which is what is more uh, computing intensive. So it's scenarios where you're actually dealing with a lot of logged in users. So the classic example of that is if you have an e-commerce site, and you're newsletter driven or you're sales driven, your site normally doesn't get a lot of traffic, but then you might get hundreds or even thousands of people showing up with a cart. And that cart, that cart isn't it's something nice. that, uh, that Cloudflare can just cash for you. Like they're actually, like, it's actually like real data that needs to, like, it's something that needs to communicate with WordPress. So when that happens, WordPress has to be able to like, what's hosting WordPress has to be able to scale, um, to handle that demand, uh, yeah. that is very computing. So it's like more CPUs, uh, as opposed to just, uh, with a CDN, it's just, it's just like page caching. So like the, the HTML has already been rendered and then we just send it back. So it's very, so that's kind of the, the long answer to that. But, um, specifically in the case of serverless, yeah. what we're interested in is that CPU side scaling. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people came up to me after because they're like, oh my God, like I host these types of sites that like, you know, it's, it could be like a concert, you know, like you have ticket sales. Uh, yep. Like another example was, uh, I had a friend that ran a uh, microbreweries. So microbreweries, they, they release batches of, of beer and yep. then people will come in to, and there's a limited quantity of that too. So like there's an actual like there's an actual like need to not oversell what you have as well, right? Which is can yeah, be tricky yeah. with caching. So there's all these very tricky, more demanding uh, scaling problems that a lot of the hosting companies aren't really equipped to handle well right now, um, but that a lot of people are struggling with. Um, and a lot of WooCommerce especially uh, is very frustrated and struggling with. So if you like work with WooCommerce and you deal with these kinds of scenarios, um, those are a lot of the people that came up and talked to me after. They were either hosting companies that were hosting these sites and they were like, well, like how do I deal with this? And I was just like, there's no easy, there's no easy way to. No, no. I have, like, you, yeah. I have nothing no, to ahead. comfort you softly. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I mean, but that's where serverless comes in. So that's what the talk was about. So it was like, it explained what it, how it worked right. architecturally. Uh, I would start oh. by showing. Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, I was going to say, so what does that, what does that look like? Because um, I think 
I think it's fair to say that we've all seen the various scenarios where uh, a server crashes because WordPress got too much traffic in a too short of a time frame. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So how does that look like? Well, first of all, I think I should probably say what serverless means because everybody loves making fun of the term. Uh, so yeah, yeah. are there it, still, it I make fun of it in the talk too. I'm like, is are there still serverless servers with serverless? And the answer is yeah. like, yes, there's still servers. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the term. Um, whoever in whatever marketing department decided to call it serverless, um, you've done us a huge disservice. Uh, but it's the term that we have now and we're just going to have to live with it. But the idea with serverless is that it makes servers outside of your sphere of concern. So like you, do, you don't actually, like people that work in JavaScript understand this super fundamentally. Like when they deploy the Vercel, they're never asking themselves, hey, how many CPUs does this machine have? How many PHP workers? Like, uh, like how much RAM? Like they're like, what are these things? Like I don't like updating an operating system. Like what's the operating system behind this? Like they're like, I don't. I don't know. I don't care. Um, and that's kind of serverless. It's, it's that it abstracts a lot of this, um, this basically this need to know of servers. Like you just upload code and the code runs on demand. So how does that help with this specifically? Well, specifically, what this allows you to do is it allows you to scale that compute problem at a, at a rate that nobody else can do it. So um, maybe we can, like, I don't know if you do podcast notes, but I can, I had like a, a, I can. a demo, like I, I did a technical demo that I prepared for WordCamp Asia where I did 4,000 WooCommerce orders in 15 minutes and we could see it like scale elastically um, to the demand. So to give yeah, an idea, yeah. if you know a bit about servers, we went from basically zero PHP workers to basically 1,200, I think, uh, oh, yeah. in the span of a minute, um, like of a few minutes. So to do that with a regular architecture is essentially not possible. Um, like even with the most, you'd need something really well calibrated uh, to be able to pull that off. But just being yeah. able to spin up a site and then troll basically i true 1500 browsers at it like people trying to buy products um at it at the same mm -hmm. time and so that elastic um the, like that way to elastically scale your compute is something that serverless is really good at and honestly the only limit i hit in that test was the fact that the load testing software could only give me 1500 browsers to to do the load test with <laughs> so it wasn't actually like oh this was like the limit that what like aws lambda or serverless could do it was just oh like i i need to ask for more like and um i haven't yet but i thought that was like already impressive so yeah for that, that it is, wasn't, it is. yeah I, again do, how many people need this not that many but what i i talk about is a lot is that I, I'm, I'm a technologist. Like I like technology. I like building stuff that nobody can think of or like, like find hard problems to solve. And there were a lot of hard problems to solve for uh, serverless um, WordPress. But what this allows you is like, we talked a lot about, like I talked a lot about these e-commerce sites, but there's also this yeah. idea that what if you want to build products with WordPress? like what if you want to build, let's say, why, like one of the examples I gave at WordCamp Asia is like, why couldn't Gravity Forms have just a standalone Gravity Forms product, like Google Forms or Typeform? Yeah. And the reason for that is maybe they don't, just don't have the expertise to, to host something like that, like at scale. But like, what if you didn't need that? You know, like my favorite story, um, we'll get to like how I got to working on that, but like Emir's idea comes from Laravel. Like Laravel has a product called uh, Laravel Vapor. And yep. I was there when Taylor announced it. And I was like, I'm going to build that for WordPress. And that was basically how I got started. But, but inside the Laravel community, there's a product called Fadden Analytics. I'm sure there's probably people that are going to listen to this that uh, 
especially if you're in Europe, you probably might know them because they're a privacy focused analytics company. They, they and... were originally co founded by a Dutch guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But now it's like Paul Jarvis and, uh, yeah. Oh my God. Jack Ellis. Uh, but Jack Ellis has been like a really strong proponent of serverless. But what's been super insane with them is, there are basically two people, one developer, and they're handling like, you know, hundreds of millions of requests a minute with this yep. as two people. Yeah. And so that I'm like, just like, I don't know what cool things. I, I mean, Emir has a, co a couple of cool products that people are building on top of it, but, um, but I'm just there to give you the tools. Like what kind of like WordPress products could people build if they, you know, you could abstract away the fact, like your customer didn't even need to know it was WordPress, like, um, mm -hmm. and, and things like that, but you didn't have the, the budget or something like that to build out that infrastructure. Now you don't need to, you can just deploy code and then it just works. As long as you pay your AWS, yeah. you know, like it works. So that's kind of like. Is that the like, TLDR for uh, Emir? Yeah, that's the TLDR with Emir. I wish it was as simple as that because WordPress, unfortunately, wasn't designed to uh, scale like this way. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I think there's still a lot of performance optimization that needs to happen. Like, especially if you have a site with like a lot of plugins and things like that, the behavior can be. It depends on the plugins. Like some of them, they they work great. Some of them don't work as well, and it really depends on the plugins and what they're doing. Because, so that was one of the. I'd questions love to I say, plugin. yeah. In in terms of compatibility, um, is is any site uh, running into performance issues? Is that a candidate for for Emir? Yeah, I mean, like, I talked with wait. Johnny Aris a decent amount, who's on the performance yep. team too. Um, he was on the first podcast uh, of mine. Yeah. So I talk with him um, a decent amount about things. Um, there's definitely things that happen that plugins do, but it's like in terms of plugin compatibility, like what plugins work and don't work, it's been very minor. Usually, it's the ones that I don't want you to install anyways, like a security <laughs> plugin, like yeah. like yeah. like I Team Security or something like that. You don't need that. So that's another thing with serverless, like it's read all that's. That's a good and a bad thing. So if you come from a more professionalized, enterprise environment, you will be like, oh, that's obvious. But you can install a plugin. You have mm -hmm. to install the plugin and then deploy the code again because the entire environment is read-only. Yeah. Um, so for some people that, like I've lost customers because of that, because they were like, why, why can't I install a team or something directly? And I'm like, well, that's not how you get the scaling. Like the, the scaling comes from the fact that everything's packaged and ready to basically be, you know, multiplied by a thousand or 2000 times, uh, yeah. in a split of a second. Uh, but that also helps with security because now you can't write anything. So, so that's why you don't really need a lot of these security plugins because, um, yeah, I mean, you need two factor authentication. You need, uh, like I suggest, like I have a small one that connects to, uh, the, the, have I been pwned API? So like to so yep. make sure that you're not using um, passwords that have been like basically hacked already, uh, things like that. But in terms of protecting and reading the file system and all that stuff, you don't need that. So those are the ones. Um, the other ones that cause issues are media library plugins. So the media library was by far the hardest part um, to get working on this because with serverless, you also don't really have a machine to upload the images to anymore. Uh, okay. so, so I had to so rewrite part of the media three. library. Sorry? So where do you upload them to? S3. Okay. Which there's a lot of plugins that do that, but they sync them in the background. But yeah. there's no place to sync them from. So I had to rewrite the media library to actually like send them directly to S3. Um, that was so like... On the let me let me let me make sure that I understand this correctly. On the WordPress install itself, not the active live site, but the installation where you do your content and photos. Yeah, when you upload, like when you open the media library and you say upload picture, 
Yeah. It'll look the we... same, but what's happening behind the scenes is I'm sending it to S3. Yeah. So, but the installation where that uh, WordPress install lives yeah. is not production. It's sort of staging. Is that a good analogy? Um, I don't know. What would, what would be production versus staging in this scenario? Production is whatever somebody sees uh, as a live site. Okay. And staging is essentially whatever is the next version of the production site. No, no, it's like production. I mean, the, it's really, it's really just like WordPress wasn't designed. Again, like this is something if you deal with any other framework or Drupal or something like that, if they're like, oh, I like, we don't actually want to send, like, let's say you want to upload a, a file. You can tell it, like, I don't want to send it to the machine. Like, I want to send it somewhere yep. else. Um, and WordPress doesn't make that easy to do. Ah, okay. Yeah, like, yeah. Now, so like, the, the, my, my question, if, I, if I'm uh, yeah. just trying yeah, to, to clarify for everybody listening who not, doesn't fully understand uh, what, uh, what, uh, what serverless means in this context, uh, do they still log into a WordPress site to do what yes. they need to do? Yeah. When they hit publish, is it instant on production yeah. visible. Okay. So there's no syncing in between what you see with some of those headless solutions. Nope. It is in, the, in, in that case, it's, it's a little bit different, uh, from, uh, traditional headless as far as that is a concept. You could do headless with serverless. I actually did a, bl a blog post talking about it on the Emir yeah. blog. Um, yeah, headless is, so serverless is about the infrastructure. Headless is about basically the markup, like you're saying, like, yeah. I want to, like, I want to have something separate that handles displaying information. And then WordPress in that scenario just becomes a da data source. Yeah. So that's a good distinction to make because for most people, if we're hearing serverless, we're automatically inclined to think headless or, you know, I think that comes from the JavaScript ecosystem because a lot of what headless in JavaScript is also serverless. Um, yeah. so they, they use the terms. They, they, they sound like they're interchangeable, but they're solving two okay. different things. Yeah. Um, which is really good actually with headless too, because headless, like you, you, and if you have headless and serverless, then you really don't have to worry about anything. Right. So you deploy your code and then your code scales as you need it. And then your front end scales as you need it. So it's just, it's painless because of that. But, um, right now, if you do headless WordPress, there's always a machine handling that data source so, like yeah. you can still overwhelm that machine yeah um, easily easily with that so it solves that problem but yeah the media the media stuff was tricky because like i said the thing with server serverless is that there is a less part in it is that you know the machine there's like one common question is like what like that you might ask is like how big is the machine or mm -hmm. how do i ssh into the machine well, you yeah. can't SS, there's no machine to SSH to. There's no, there's no machine per se, right? Like there's just your code. Your code exists in the cloud somewhere. And then there's a machine somewhere. You don't need to know what it is. You don't need to know anything about it. It's going to run your code. That's a very interesting to. distinction. Um, and, but that causes problems when you have assumptions built into the software that there's a machine there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. the problem with the media library and all these offload, like offload media, offload media S3 or the human made S3 plugin is that they all work on with the assumption that you're going to upload that file to a machine somewhere and then they yeah. can do something from that machine and then send it to S3. But because there's no machine now, you actually legitimately have to send the file to its final destination um, right away. So that's a, that's a very interesting thing because that makes whatever you're doing uh, quite alienated from core WordPress. Oh like yeah. The whole, the whole of WordPress, like everything in its settings and configurations assumes it's living on a machine. Correct. So there's a reason I'm one of the few people in all of WordPress that could have built this product because you needed to go really deep. Like an Emir plugin that integrates with WordPress goes really like low level 
in WordPress to trick. Yeah. Like it tricks, it tricks everybody to thinking that they're on the machine. How, how close are you to, uh, can you, can you, I'm assuming the answer is yes, but I'm curious how close you are to actually wanting to rewrite core files. Uh, not close actually. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, honestly, I'm, I'm, it's the only thing right now that's not working is just because I don't really have, I'm a bit worried because they want to rewrite the media library, but yeah. that's why I'm talking with Johnny Harris a lot because I need to make sure that they don't rewrite it in a way that I can't uh, um, do something like this. Yeah, they need um, to understand your use case and then yeah, incorporate it in whatever. Yeah, that's why like I spent a lot of time with him after WordCamp Asia, just going over the tech um, and how it worked, just so he understood yep. that, um, just to have somebody that understands that scenario. Because for example, one thing that doesn't work right now, and that's also because I'm not a very strong JavaScript React developer, is that the, the media block, like the Gutenberg block, there's two yep. ways to, to interact with it, right? You can just upload a file directly, or you can just click on a tab and go to the media library and yep. interact with them. But the, the, just the plain upload button does not work right now with Emir. Uh, because I, I haven't been able to rewrite it to do what it needs to, what I've made the media library do. Um, but I guess the media library is the closest I came to hacking core. So, um, I basically unhooked the JavaScript files, default JavaScript files, and I, I made copies of them that I maintain with the changes. And then I replaced those, the, the media library, like JavaScript files with those. Oh, that. That does sound very hacky. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't say, I, I didn't say that I was like making this like super like <laughs> legit, but I don't, ha I don't hack core files. So that's all I'm saying. Yes, yes. There's no core files that were hacked, but, I, um, but I, I do I, unhook I JavaScript files and luckily they're not edited a lot. So I keep yeah. track of it, a bit, but sure. they don't, they don't, it's all really old code that doesn't get changed a lot. So. So does your plugin state. need to work with the latest version of WordPress or do you like maintain uh, a, a few versions um, backwards or how does that work? I don't, it's so, the, what I interact with is so old and so baked. Mm -hmm. Like it's stuff like I interact with like the uploads URL filter or, yeah. you know, like they're just like really old hooks that aren't likely to be uh, removed or touched. So I haven't had like version compatibility issues. Um, if anything, I've, I've taken it pretty seriously. Like I support PHP 7.2 and up. Yeah. Um, so, and that's one of the cool things with serverless too, is like if you deploy with PHP 7.2 and you never change the code again, it'll work in 10 years um, because the code was uploaded and it's there and they just have to run it. So, um, and since they're interacting with a static version, it doesn't really hurt if the, no, exactly. Correct. Correct. Update. Correct. So that in um, is, a, is an interesting use case. Yeah. Are you stuck in seven, two for whatever reasons? Yeah. Yeah. So, so planning to support it for a while, even though like I, it doesn't cost me anything to keep supporting it. Right. So from a, from a, th there are different perspectives from where that might be uh, something you do. Um, it, here's an interesting uh, thing. You, you've mentioned uh, S3, Amazon. Yeah. Um, is there any other cloud hosting service that you could work with or already work with? No, I don't want to, I, I got that question a bunch of times. I, um, there's a couple of reasons. I even talk about it in my talk, the WordCamp Asia talk. Yeah. One, um, so I'm going to be a bit harsh. If you're a GCP fan here, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I would never build my business uh, relying on, on Google Cloud. Um, they deprecate. They don't respect backwards compatibility. Like, imagine you're me and I'm one person. I have to, like, build something that's incredibly complex, deals with, I think I'm up to 15 to 20 services in AWS yep. that Amir interacts with. 
And those services could have their API changed. They're, they could be sunsetted at any time. Like I would, I would be, I would be stressed the hell out, uh, like having to maintain that. So that's one of the reasons. So like, this is why I don't do GCP. In fact, I, I joke that I would probably support Oracle cloud before I supported GCP. Just that's, how, that's how <laughs> my, that's like how low my, 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 uh, my cloud engineer, uh, opinion is of GCP. Um. But let's say Azure. Azure is like legit. Like, so um, the reason why is because even though they all have these kind of similar services, they don't work the same way. They don't interact no. the same way. They don't, they don't, um, they're not interchangeable. Um, no. So you would need to write an API layer just to be able to. More, I think more than that, I might have to do a completely different architecture. Uh, oh, of okay. how I even host it, right? Like it depends how it works, what they have, what features they have, um, yeah. like how the different services behave and things like that. So it's not it's not a one on one thing. And then the other aspect is that in general, all the energy around serverless right now is all on AWS. Right. So there's like in PHP, there's something called Breath. Uh, I talk it's it's uh, this guy named Matsu Napoli. And he, he built that. He is the OG person to work on serverless PHP. So he, okay. he did it before Taylor did uh, Laravel Vapor. Um, and we owe a lot to, to him. Um, but he only does AWS too. Like it's just all the energy across all the different um, programming languages is all focused on AWS. So you'll find better resources, uh, tutorials, answers to problems. Um, it, so it's not super. Useful. Okay. That makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. I, I, I'm, I'm asking it from not even necessarily from the Azure or Google uh, side of things, but what if I want to maintain where my data is and have my, either my, my own cloud or yeah, uh, Ocean, Linode, whatever. Oh no, wait. I mean, not, the, not the Linode anymore, that, right? no, no, they call it Akamai now. It's Akamai. Oh, yeah cloud or uh, Kamai hosting or whatever, but uh, yeah, they renamed it. Um, I mean, there's Hertzinger too in Europe. Um, that's, that's really big. Um, I don't think so behind the scenes, what runs Lambda is something open source that AWS open source a firecracker. Um, and you could technically host something like firecracker on a machine and then try to do it. But the reality is that one of the things that I think, I think you can appreciate this, but I think a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate when they like, it's really easy to jump at these cloud providers and be like, like wow, the markup's like so crazy. Like I could just get this like $5 vulture box and, yeah. and, and just like run things there. But there's they've abstracted like as somebody that's been assistant men since like they're 16 uh working at law firms like i did like multi data center redundancies with vmware when i was like 20 okay and i was like I, um they abstract a stupid amount of infrastructure complexity yeah. to a simple api call yeah. um there's more to hosting serverless than, than just um, having like a machine with Firecracker that you can deploy this thing on. Like, how do you make sure that it works across data centers? How do you how do you do like failovers? How do you do like you know if, yeah. if performance between the two like if performance on one machine is degrading, how do you fail over to the next one automatically? Like they yeah. do all of that for you, like. And, and, and you would have to spend an enormous amount of energy and time to oh, yeah. make what Emir does uh, work on oh, yeah. the platform. So it doesn't make sense to even start yeah. considering going in that direction. Okay, yeah. Yeah, even for product people. So here's a, a discussion I had at WordCamp Asia. So I was talking with, I think, engineer one of Elementor. Yeah. And we were talking infrastructure and things like that. So like they have like five or six you say, um, don't take my, my word exactly for it, but um, they have five, and, five or six like infrastructure people just to deal with their Black Friday sale. 
Mm. Um, and they were like talking how they have this like Kubernetes stack and it works so well and stuff like that. And I was like, well, what happens if your platform changes or something code changes? They're like, oh, we have to recalibrate everything. Yeah. 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 It was like, uh, we have to recalibrate everything. And I was like, and I was like talking about what this does. He's like, oh yeah, this is like simpler because like, yeah, it might not be as well calibrated, but it works like, like you just upload your code and it works, right? And there's a lot of stuff that you would have to do yourself that gets kind of like folded into this extra cost that you are just thinking, oh, this is expensive. And you're right, it is more expensive. Like their CDN's a bit more expensive than Cloudflare. Their yep. compute's a bit more expensive than Cloudflare. But you know what you never hear of? You never hear about like, you know, AWS going down is a very freaking rare occurrence. Um, and Two like, years, like I joke in, uh, yeah, but and when I joke cool. about it, like if your site goes down, like if you're hosting on AWS and your site goes down because AWS has an outage, you're the least of your client's problems right now. Like half the internet oh, sure. is probably out like sure. at the same time. So it's just, there's just a, like, I take it super seriously, like, as well. Like, Emir, I consider to be, um, there are people now trying to build hosting products on top of this. And I take it really seriously the same way AWS does. Like, my test suite for Emir takes 12 hours to run. Um, oh. uh, just to make sure that it actually does what it can do. And it's resilient and people can, you know, there's still bugs and things like that. Uh, but but I make sure that things don't break. Um, oh, that is, uh, is, is, uh, well, you got to uh, provision the resources, provision resources, apply changes, make sure that they work, uh, that the behavior is expected. Yeah. Um, and some of them I have to do across all the data, the regions. No, but that's um, super, that's super decent. Uh, yeah. So you, you already answered, uh, one of the questions I had about Emir in terms of, uh, of what it provides. Cause you, you, you mentioned. Uh, in in um, in a nutshell, what it does, it, it yeah. provides a set of tools uh, for you to be able to run WordPress serverless. Yeah. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, there are folks building modules on top of Emir that allow for uh, hosting. So my question was going to be, uh, how much do you consider yourself as a tool provider versus hosting company? Because by the sound I'm not a hosting company, and that's really well, intentional. No. Okay, it is intentional. It is intentional. I would, I, I've rebuffed dozens of investment offers, and also people asking me like, "Why aren't you building hosting?" And because, um, yeah, somebody well, has told me this, but it's uh, hosting. The best analogy I heard it last year from Dave Ryan, who's at Newfold. Yeah. And he said, and it was the truest thing. You will probably relate to this because you work with uh, Circle. But a hosting company is actually a customer service company that happens to have a data center. Uh, and I don't want to, I love customer service, but I want, I want my customers to be developers. I don't want right. it to be um, like just anybody. Um, so I'm okay leaving that money on the table but the thing that is happening so here's like kind of my high level view of what's happening right now so emir is also a tool that you can just sign up and just like it's a cli tool uh eventually i wanted it to be a bit closer to vercel like you'll be able to do a lot more from the admin uh but right now i'm not really losing customers because the dashboard's not really powerful like uh that's usually not how i'm losing customers um but so I got it to have that product where you can just bring up a WordPress site or like create a project or, or, um, yeah. but there's a subset of people where they just like, this is complex tech and there's only like a few hosting companies that have the budget and the know-it-all to like, actually like bring this forward. Um, there's like, uh, ba I basically had. WP Engine and Pagely, but I think actually Pagely got gutted with the recent layoffs. So inside GoDaddy, so I'm not even yep. convinced that GoDaddy um, could do this right now. So there's like WP Engine is really the only people that use AWS because Pantheon does not use AWS. Um, 
they would have to develop some product like that. But the idea is that there's a really long tail of hosting companies that won't have the, the ability to do this. Um, and that Emir can be. What do you mean if won't have the ability? Like the technical know how or? The technical know how specifically. Okay. And yeah. is that because the, of um, the complexity of Emir to, to even use it as a, as a base? I, you built your, I think your... it's not a complexity of Emir. I think it's a complexity of just cloud infrastructure. It's a completely different right. skill set to design cloud infrastructure and wire, you know, a whole bunch of services together into a platform than it is to actually like just have spin up like line up, like choose your choose your server provider lino digital ocean or whatever and spin yep. up some machines uh using like let's say you're like there's a lot of hosting companies that use grid pane so like they just use grid pane to manage their server fleet and yep. and so it's oh, easy to have a... yeah sorry but I was going to say, unless you have a fully uh, custom dashboard, uh, entirely built on uh, as an API, mm -hmm. then we're starting to make sense in terms of what could be hooked into yeah. Uh, Emir. Yeah. Well, I mean, the main co the main competitor to me right now of Emir, to me the the one that I think is the closest is actually WP Cloud. So, okay. uh, so. Uh, if you're not familiar with WP Cloud, because they're, they're, it's an automatic product, but they, they're really yep. not very good at marketing it. Um, it's basically a CLI tool that lets you spin up environments on their infrastructure. Um, yep. And they basically want to use it as a kind of API for hosting companies to use and, and just have, they would manage the infrastructure. And then via the API, you would basically bring up sites and things like that and do all the maintenance uh, around that. Uh, so I consider them the closest thing to what Emir wants to be in terms of platform, except you when I wouldn't even host the, the hardware, like it's still your AWS account. So yeah, yeah. Um, but the idea is the same, right? So you can you can have this API. So now there's an SDK. So Emir has an SDK which I built for um, one of my basically potential partnerships that I just split the code out so that you have an SDK to interact with the Emir API. So that if yep. you want to build, like I had somebody building a Laravel application where the, the application would spin up the sites and stuff like that and, and manage yep. the sites, um, things like that. So that's like one angle where I'm going. Um, and that's probably like the, one that's going to get me pro like not profitable, but like be able to work on this full time. Uh, side note, a lot of my stats are public. Like if you go to emirapp.com slash open, you can see it. Like I'm making, I'm at 1200 MRR right now. Um, mm -hmm. but like, I can't work on this full time still after four years, I started working on this in 2019. Uh, I remember so, you tweeting about this uh, a little while back. Yeah, so the, uh, it's tomorrow. been a long journey. Um, Matsu Napoli, who does Breath 2, we've talked about, like, because Laravel Vapor makes a, makes a lot of money. Like, I I estimated that in the first year, he was probably making half a million from it. Uh, um, oh. is, so I thought, oh, well, you know, like, I, it shouldn't be that hard to make, like, a fraction of that. <laughs> Incorrect. Like. <laughs> Incorrect. Uh, it's been very hard uh, to to do. Um, but what is what is the main reason for that? You think? Huh? What is the main reason for that? You think why why is it not picking up as as um, you sort of anticipated? Is WordPress the the um, WordPress is a bit of a challenge? On? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. The, there's a challenge, right? Like I said, it's not. I wish I could say like you're you'll deploy any site to this and it'll it'll perform amazingly. Uh, mm -hmm. There's just one one thing that we haven't talked. Uh, I know you had also Till before, but Till actually saved yep. my product. Um, so one thing that is baked into WordPress is that what I talked earlier, this idea that you're on a machine. Yeah, and. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of gross inefficiencies. And you do a lot of performance work, so you're aware of that. 
of yep. two, uh, there's a lot of gross inefficiencies that get kind of basically papered over by just throwing more hardware at it or just yep. by being on the same machine. Yep. And the one thing that I can't get around when you start using serverless is latency. So yep. latency, you now have to deal with, like latency for, for those who aren't familiar with the term is just basically the time it takes to communicate with an external service. So it could be your database, it could be your Redis cache. When everything's on the same machine, that, that time is essentially zero. Uh, but mm, once you start moving everything out of the machine, which you have to do, uh, yep. that, that time becomes not zero. It might be incredibly small, but if somebody is doing something really gross, even if it's really small, um, it could cause a lot of issues. So what ended up happening early on, um, I have to do a case study for Till for this, bit, by the way, but I'm just shilling his product right now. But, um, okay. and, oh, but basically what happened word. early on is I remember testing WooCommerce with somebody and we were doing load tests and they were like, holy shit, that's amazing. Uh, like, okay, but we haven't added the object cache yet. It's going to be even better once we add the object cache. And mm -hmm. we added the object cache and the admin went from loading like sub one second to taking six seconds to load. Oh. And I was arms. like, yeah. And I was like, wait, like, what's happening here? Um, and I ended up figuring out eventually it was that uh, Redis. So the site was making, let's say, I, I don't remember exactly, but 1,500 requests to Redis. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say a, a request you before it caused zero so 15 times 1500 times zero is still zero but yep. if now the time is two milliseconds it's not a big it's not a big amount it's two milliseconds yeah. like a trivial <laughs> exactly. amount but yep. you do it 1500 times you now just added three seconds to your load time just to talk to redis it compounds uh, so that caused a lot of issues and luckily uh till was working on a php extension for redis called relay um yep, I think he released yesterday yeah i mean i've been using it like i don't even ship, um emir the the runtime like what runs php uh doesn't even ship with the regular php redis extension it just ships with relay because yep. relay is the only way that redis can work um, the way it works is that it keeps an in-memory copy of, of some of the data and then it keeps it in sync so that you basically get that sweet zero uh, millisecond yeah. uh, latency for, for Redis, except for the first time when the cache isn't primed. But um, because of that, yeah, so that was like one of the examples. But basically, you know, you can get a lot of these kind of gross um, scenarios where you basically are just papering over the problem with the machine. Yep. And then you're going to put it in email and you'll be like, why isn't it as fast on the server? Like, that's like every time that somebody says me that, like in my head, I have like, you know, the melting smiley face, like emoji yep. that they came <laughs> out of. Like, that's like basically how I feel inside. Uh, because then I have to explain to somebody that like, it's, it, it's not like, it's not a magical tool. Uh, right. It doesn't. It doesn't it actually works, like. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say if if it was magical, if if uh, whatever you threw at it, you would most likely see larger growth. Um, is, is essentially what you're saying. There is still a complexity um, layer. Yeah, I mean, there's also the fact that it's a CLI tool, and a lot of of uh, WordPress um, people aren't super comfortable with CLI tools. Um, that's it's like more of it. It's, it's more developer focused. And honestly, I'd rather do that than, than like, you have to think we could have an entire other podcast on like how to design your, the business that you want. Like, cause I think about yeah. that a lot and, yeah. and it's just, I love developers. Like I, like I show this to developers as some of it, 
some of the problem is just switch over costs, which I think coming from servable, you, you understand, like it's like mm -hmm. hard to get somebody to switch over, um, yeah. to anything. Once they're in something like it's just the, the switch over cost is huge. Uh, so it's hard to get people to switch over, even if they're really interested in using it. Um, we were doing, we were doing pretty okay there, by the way, just for, um, the, 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 the switch for costs were relatively low. Uh, because we were essentially, essentially white gloving most of that, and they were yeah. already into serious troubles. Um, yeah. So they. Yeah. Well, I do that when I have people with serious problems, but also I have to just be realistic that I can't, as one person trying to survive and not making enough to pay myself from this. Like, there's only like so much white gloving that I can do with people, uh, and it's it's hard when you do like I've done like sometimes 20 to 30 hours of customer service to someone and then they cancel. And that like, is just like, Oh, that brutal. hurts. Uh, th that's brutal. I mean, they help make the product better. So I'm still grateful for them, but yeah, that's always going to yeah, be a but, challenge. Yeah. That's not how you, uh, you, you intended for that, uh, interaction no. to happen. But I just thought there was more developers that were like, secretly like Laravel lovers that were just like waiting for this. And the answer is like, there weren't I, that many. No, um, I think, I think we're at the cusp actually of, uh, of the eruption of, uh, more developers like that. Um, I think so. I, I mean, I get more and more inbound interest. Um, and especially once people have been working in JavaScript, like I don't have to explain the product to them, but if they've done right. JavaScript before it's, right. it's pure PHP developers that don't really that struggle a bit to understand what the value proposition is because they're like, well, one, this is way more expensive, um, to host, um, mm -hmm. you can't host this for $5 a month. So, I mean, I cost $39 by itself and just like your, your basic on like always on stuff, like, uh, your database starts at $15 a month. So like you're basically looking at something like 60 like 60 70 dollars us a month to just have one site as a base so a lot and then the, the easy terms on uh, uh on top of that so the the actual usage usage of the um um the serverless part oh that's so cheap i don't i don't think people understand how cheap this is so that four thousand do you know how much that four thousand orders load test yeah. cost no ten dollars ten dollars oh okay so that's that's not too bad. That's but zero if, point if zero. You were to say, if you were to say you would have you have a WooCommerce site now, yeah. and you're struggling to find hosting that works for your particular set of traffic, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, if you're making good money with your WooCommerce site, you're fine with a bill of hosting somewhere between two fifty and five hundred dollars a month. Yeah, in my mind, you so should. That'll be, be really hard to hit. Right, that'll be really hard to. That'll be really hard to hit with, uh, with the email. Yeah, with email. Because don't forget, you're not paying for anything when nobody's around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in, in my mind, then the use case is much larger than developers. The use case possibly should be, um, and this is not me telling you how to do it, but yeah. more me trying to understand, like, so for who, for anybody listening uh, or watching. Um, or watching, yeah. Um, when is your scenario, when is your product a, a, a solution? And that's essentially a much larger set than developers like who, who enjoy um, working in a smart way, um, yeah. understanding serverless. So the, the proposition that you have is much larger than that. Um, oh yeah, it's you, I mean, it's bigger. I mean, the proposition is there's twofold. There's like on the hosting side, right? Which we've talked a lot of is the, yep. These kind of, the key use case is um, spiky, non-cacheable traffic. Yeah. So and WooCommerce and a lot like that. Correct. So WooCommerce, e-commerce is the classic kind of example. Uh, another one that I was thinking about is like, if you run your own EDD licensing server, like you yep. can DDoS yourself right. and things like that. The other one is any sort of e-learning platform. Yeah. LMS. Um, LMS, because if you do membership like sites. those membership Buddy sites, sites. yeah. So some of the customers that I have are e-learning. So they're, they have kind of like, um, live sessions of a course or something yeah. like that. And then everybody's coming in at the same time, logging in, um, yeah. 
huge spike of traffic. And then when they're not, there's no course going on, the site's essentially dormant, right? So, yeah. um, so all these kind of spiky, what I call WordPress applications. So I think uh, like on the hosting company side, like I had a talk with the VP of hosting, I think of Newfold, like at WordCamp US Lab. He's the one that really put me on the on the path for this, but it's like how to scale WordPress applications. So, because yep. you have WordPress content sites, which are a largely solved hosting solution. Like they yep. basically, I call them like every hosting company that basically sells you a vanilla, like it's kind of like, like getting vanilla ice cream, but you're getting a different flavor of vanilla. Like, oh, WP Engine gives you French vanilla and GoDaddy just gives you like the soft serve vanilla. And, exactly. But they're all kind of it's vanilla. vanilla like, and it's so, yeah. yeah. They, they all follow a certain structure, which I gave a talk in 2016 on. Basically, they all follow the same architectural structure and, um, and it solves that problem really well. But because, like I said early on in the, in, in the podcast, there's that type of scaling for content site where you're just getting bombarded by request for essentially static content, which mm -hmm. is easy to serve back. That problem is largely solved. But how to scale what I call WordPress applications, like WordPress, where you're using WordPress, but as an application to do more, more content, like e-commerce, e-learning, uh, membership yeah. sites, uh, like it could be uh, also like um, BuddyPress, like uh, community sites, uh, things like that, where it's, you're actually dealing with a lot of logged in traffic, lots of what you consider like an application use case where it's it's your scaling requirements are more on the CPU side than just content delivery. Um, this is where Emir really is going to be good. And that's where a lot of the hosting companies are going anyways, because that's where they all see, like I know everybody in every hosting company uh, at this point, because I was speaking at so many events. The only people you see at all the work camps are essentially hosting companies. So I just know everybody. Uh, right. And um, that's where they're thinking. That's why you're seeing a lot of managed WooCommerce coming out. And then you're seeing managed LearnDash. Uh, you're seeing these kind of like more specialized hosting solutions for these applications because they have different scaling requirements and hosting requirements. Um, yeah. Yeah. And this is where I, I know that I'm the better solution than whatever throwing a machine at it because there's only like like i said like just to give you an idea like you're not mo i assume most people here aren't really into like servers as much as i am but let's say the biggest server you can get right now is something like uh it's what like 192 like is it 192 cores and like no is it 96 core and 192 treads but it's like somewhere like around that. That. Yeah. yeah something like that like the amount of PHP workers you could have with this is usually you can multiply it by basically two or three, the number of treads. So if you're like at 92, like core than 192, you're looking at maybe 500 to 600 PHP workers. Yep. If you remember, like I said earlier, um, when I did that load test, I went from zero to 1200 in yep. a minute. So that is two and a half times, let's say, that largest machine you can buy on the market, which yeah. basically costs you like $3,000 a month or something like that to keep running. Um, so there's just a limit to what you can do with a single machine. That's why like everybody else in every other business on the planet has like Terraform and like auto scaling and Kubernetes setups and stuff like that because it, there's a limit to what one machine can handle and yep. nobody in WordPress is really tackling. There's a couple of hosting companies now like Convesio is kind of tackling that a bit, but they're not, they're not simple problems to solve. And this is so simple. Like, so it's just, but this and it's really important to these applications. Yeah. With Emir and yep. with applications, they need that because if yep. you want WooCommerce to take on, to be a serious contender to taking on shops that like, if you want to start taking people that are on Shopify to start thinking about like coming to use WooCommerce. You need to have a solid. Have to be able, 
you need to have a platform that can handle this. Like, yeah. it's like, so there's just a lot of conversations that are happening around that. And like so, serverless is, is the tool to do it for WordPress, I think. At least yeah. there's Kubernetes and, and stuff. But I think for most people, they don't have the budget that Elementor or like some big hosting no, and it, and it And it's a different level of complexity that you don't necessarily want to find yourself in. Um, yeah. If you can solve that by uh, yeah, the, the Amazon platform and, and Emir. I mean, my personal, another... yeah, it's all right. Uh, my personal take on it is that Kubernetes is like an in-between tech. Yeah. It's like I, in between it. I think for I, most people, they won't need you to use it. No, no, I, I agree. I, I think it's, uh, um, I think I tweeted this last week, something about, um, you don't always need the, the, the most complex thing, uh, uh just because it's there. Um, just no. try to think of what you can use and the most smart and, and, and most nimble way. And that's probably going to solve your problem better than, uh, throwing more complexity at it. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it sounds like, like if I'm translating what you're saying and the use cases and the, um, the, the things happening, it, 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 to me, it sounds like you're on the cusp of breakthrough. Like I, I see a bright I future. So. For I mean, I think so. It's just been long man. <laughs> yes, Four yes. years is a long time, to, but well, you, I, I, I think there's more. About there's it. more. Yeah, I was going to say there's more who have overnight success in, in five, six years. So you're, you're still within yeah. that. Uh, yeah, Within that I mean, I've been very honest. Uh, like I said, I'm very public. I write a report every two weeks uh, that you can sign up to, like um, where I talk about what I've done for the past two weeks. I usually do one week marketing and one week product. Yep. And then I talk about the business, but I also talk about it when I do a year in review as well. And I really hate how everybody uses the term, but I've, if I, for, I'm in an innovator's dilemma situation. So if you don't know what the innovator's dilemma is, is uh, it's this, it comes from this business book by uh, this uh, professor, this famous professor called Clay Christensen. Uh, he, he passed away now, but um, he, it's this book that discusses how technologies come and overtake um, previous, like new technologies slowly creep up and overtake um, the like incumbent uh, technology. And yep. a lot of the way of how it works usually is that the technology starts off worse than the current good stuff. Yeah. But for specific things, it is very good. And for and those specific things, it, it, yeah. And, and usually how they start off is they, they just chip away at it with those specific cases where it's really good. And then eventually they just overtake the other one um a classic example because it's an old book so like he talks about mainframes like mainframes like that's like like before servers like it was like yep. mainframes but before the personal computer um and how like the mainframe makers basically eventually got overtaken by the by those um com personal computers yep. because it was just mainframe needed an entire basement in a building to exist uh and they you had a little personal computer that eventually could do the same thing that the mainframe did uh and took half the space and you could put it on every desk in a building um have you ever seen one of those uh, rooms by the way no i've i've i, ne have, I've, I have okay no i've, I've, worked I've only at done a, server a rack so I've, I've worked at an insurance company and um we work with AS 400s and, and other, uh, mainframe type stuff there. Yeah. Are, I mean, there's still an app and you work with insurance companies. I'm sure they're still there. Yeah, <laughs> probably. But just, the the, the, you, you said it filled an entire basement, but he, when, when, when you said that, Carl, you meant that literally, um, yeah, they are that it's, big. They are that big. Um, yeah. but he talks about different scenario not just computing um there was like motorcycles it was like there's different use cases but um yeah. this idea that the new technology always starts off worse um but it has a greater potential and i think this is this scenario here because right now 
it's really good for the ca the use cases that I've been talking about. Um, and are there a lot of them? Like how many how many stores need like like I had like when I was in Tokyo for uh, six weeks and I and uh, automatics of uh, VP uh, no the director of operations um, lives there half the year. I had mm. dinner with him twice. And I sent him that video and he's like, wow, that's crazy. We can't do that. Um, but how many people need that uh, right now? But that's not the question I'm asking myself is like, what, like if we want WordPress or WooCommerce to be a valid solution to take mm -hmm. on a, a, a platform, like what do we need to think about for the next 10 years um, to get us there? So, and to me, that's where I see it. Like I, it's just, it's slow. Like I wish I, I, I wish I could say that it was an easy ride, but that's what keeps me going is this belief that, and the more time I spend, it was really hard too. One of the things that we didn't talk about is also I built this like during COVID. So yeah. it, you, you kind of feel a bit insane building something like this during COVID and you can't talk to anyone or you're just tweeting at stuff. It's just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's like, it feels a bit insane. It's gotten better once the in-person events started because I'm just a better in-person networker, but also like people are just like, oh shit, okay. Uh, yeah, we have this problem and, and we're interested in talking about it. You're, you're only confirming what I suspected uh, in terms of uh, bright future ahead because I think you are spot on. I think you are exactly at that uh, innovator's dilemma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where... Just hard. It's hard when you have no funding and you don't want funding. Uh, that's another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, like we should do another uh, podcast on building the business you want. Because like, yeah. I could yeah. do another podcast just on that. Well, uh, we might end up there, but uh, for now, I want to thank you for uh, sharing your uh, your story and um, um, the whole. Uh, yeah, I think it's a it's a large set of problems that your your product is solving. I think it's a super interesting one. Um, I'm going to dive into it a little bit more uh, than uh, glancing at your website. Uh, yeah. So I'll have questions for you uh, after. Uh, yeah. But for now, thank you so much, Carl, and um, we'll uh, we'll see you on the next one. Yeah.